So uh, let's get started with tonight's talk. So I'll start out and maybe first a little bit about me. So I'm an independent consultant uh, and blogger. Um, I've been focused on WebRTC and really working with WebRTC for about four years uh, or so now. I run a blog for WebRTC developers called WebRTC Hacks um, that's uh, been way more successful than I would have ever thought of. Um, thought it was just going to be a, a side hobby and turn into a job. Uh, but it's, it's great. I also am involved with uh, other WebRTC events, uh, similar to this, just a little bit larger scale, uh, called Cranky Geek. Our next event is actually in Bangalore in India, uh, but we also do uh, events in San Francisco, also sponsored and uh, you know, co-sponsored with Google uh, and a bunch of others. So I encourage you to check out some of those videos if you're interested in learning more, in addition to the great set of WebRTC Boston videos that we have uh, up on, on YouTube. And for everyone, I'll send out links to the presentations. I'll send out links to the videos when they're posted. Uh, so if you just pay attention to the Meetup group, um, you'll, you'll get access to all that. So how many of you have been to past, uh, past WebRC Meetups here, or WebRC Boston? If you could just get a sense of, and, and how many of you are familiar with WebRTC, at least a little bit, right? So that's good. I, so. We're, we're, we're going to go a little bit deeper, I think, than we have in the past uh, during some of these talks. So we don't have a lot of, a lot of introduction material here. But if, uh, if you're not familiar, WebRTC uh, is, a, is basically three different APIs. There's the Get User Media API, which you use to get the you know, camera and microphone from the user. Uh, and it could also be extended to doing, you know, grabbing the screen or even Canvas elements now. There's the Peer Connection API which allows you to send that real-time communication information to uh, a distant party. And then there's the data channel API, which allows you to send arbitrary data using some of the same mechanisms over that peer, peer connection. And WebRTC has been around for a few years. Uh, I'll let Eric, when he talks in a few minutes, just give a little bit from the, back, the standards background. But one of the, uh, one of the other WebRTC analysts out there, Dean Bubbly, does a forecast. In my talk here is WebRTC for billions. It's, it's a lot, you know, there's a lot of people using WebRTC already that probably don't realize it, because it's a great technology that's so easily embedded inside of existing applications and services. In fact, if you have an Android phone, you're using WebRTC, I'll talk about a lot of other uh, little applications and, um, and apps that use WebRTC, but it's already pretty prevalent and really poised to just grow more. Right, and if you look at some of the major players in the web out there, uh, you know, Google, Definitely, uh, you know, founded WebRTC and, and, and brought it here. Mozilla uh, is very far ahead. Microsoft we'll talk a little bit about, uh, but Microsoft's also jumped into the WebRTC, you know, um, bandwagon with ORTC. And then there's Apple, uh, who I'll talk about, which has uh, been largely absent, uh, but it looks like uh, perhaps that will change soon. So one of the more exciting uh, um, advancements in WebRTC recently uh, is Microsoft uh, getting more involved? So Eric Lagerway will talk a lot about the difference between WebRTC and the ORTC, Object RTC version, a bit. But you know, as it stands today, um, WebRTC does, is not natively supported in Internet Explorer. There are ways that, and, and I think Chris will talk a little bit about how you can use plugins to overcome that. But WebRTC is natively supported in Microsoft's you know, Windows 10 new Edge browser out there. Uh, and this is actually really good news for WebRTC. Um, they're, in a lot of ways, pushing, um, pushing the, the, the limits of WebRTC and some of what they're doing. Um, the, the downside of that is, you know, depending on, on what stats and what you look at, Edge only has between 1% and 3% usage. Uh, but certainly, Microsoft is doing a lot to push people away from Internet Explorer towards Windows 10 and towards Edge. Uh, and there's no evidence that they're really slowing down their investment. Uh, or interest in, in WebRTC and pushing that platform. So then we come to Safari and what is Apple doing here? And it's taken a long time to come around. Um, there's been a number of community efforts to make things really, really easy for Apple to adopt WebRTC, including an effort to put WebRTC inside WebKit. And if you're not familiar, WebKit is basically the, you know, the web rendering engine um, that, that runs Safari. Right, so essentially, a lot of the code to make this work is already there. They just need to have the engineers to take that code and incorporate it into Safari and, and put it into a, a release vehicle. And 
the really good news is they don't have it yet, but at least it looks like they're hiring those, those people to do that, right? So uh, you're all in Boston, so uh, I don't think any of you can personally help unless you're interested in moving to uh, Santa Clara uh, out there, but let's hope this, this looks like it's gonna change uh, soon. So realistically, yes, they have to hire these people, they need to train them, they need to get the code up to date and go through the process. So it's probably a still a little bit ways out, but it's not like they're ignoring this, right? And there's, there's no doubt that they're gonna do WebRTC. And WebRTC is really a, a natural fit for social networks. Uh, so, and what WebRTC is doing pretty, you know, this is a, a list of the top five uh, social networks globally. You know, Facebook uses WebRTC. I'll talk a little bit about them uh, in their messenger platform in a bit. WhatsApp, also owned by Facebook. WhatsApp uses WebRTC as part of their web interface. If you, wanna, if you actually wanna connect or call a uh, WhatsApp user uh, through the web. I don't have a lot of insight into uh, Tencent and, and WeChat and what they're doing, other than to say WeChat actually has a public statement saying they're evaluating WebRTC. And then you know, Google Plus and Hangouts and a lot of other Google projects that we've talked about in the past uh, are, are you know, obvious and definitive WebRTC users. But even beyond WebRTC on, in, on the web, I think the, the bigger story that's often missed is WebRTC on native apps and inside native apps here. And if you look at a lot of the usage uh, out there in terms of actual real minutes uh, and what people are doing, a, a lot of the usage is actually within native, right? And it's so much easier than it used to be to develop WebRTC inside a native app. Um, the native bindings and the code base to support this straight off the open source uh, community is, is way better than it was a couple years ago. There continues to be a lot of investment uh, and a lot of man hours put against making that even better. Uh, so the good news is if you are an iOS, Android developer, it's never been easier to, to work with WebRTC and it's only gonna get easier going forward. Right, and Facebook Messenger is probably the, one of the flagship examples of WebRTC users. So if you use Facebook Messenger and you, you know, push the video call button, that's all WebRTC based. And Facebook Messenger has something about 800 million users, I think they mentioned on their last call. Now, not all of those users use a real-time communications, but I've heard it's something like 100 million or so of that. So you could look at that negatively and say, oh, only one in eight of you know, Facebook Messenger users use WebRTC and there's real-time communications. Or you can look at it like, well, Facebook went from zero to 100 million uh, in less than 18 months of playing around with this technology. Right, and that's, I think that's pretty impressive. And that's also 100 million users and all those calls and times that people aren't using other apps or aren't using the regular phone to make that communication, right? And they're just starting, and they, have, they only really started marketing uh, a lot of those capabilities recently. So uh, I expect to see a lot more come out of this, right? And they're just one player, and WebRTC is getting to a point where it's actually relatively simple to, to add to other, any kind of social network, so. Right, and if you're in the traditional, you know, unified communications, the traditional telephony industry, if, it's really hard to find a vendor who's not doing something with WebRTC, or at least has it on their roadmap. In fact, even Skype, um, as part of some of their WebRTC announcements with ORTC, has promised, you know, web support, uh, including Skype. And uh, I think we'll, we'll probably start to see some of that come soon, too. Uh, and Skype, with their billion user base, uh, they're certainly gonna add to the, to the numbers. So, and this actually was an interesting quote I saw the other day. Um, you know, it's funny how used to VoIP and this telephony stuff, and it's hard for me coming to terms with this since I've basically my whole career has been in making a lot of this stuff work. But now it's actually really easy to do and not really a big deal, right? Uh, it's really just a checkbox feature. So the question is, well, a couple of sides of this. One, the exciting part is the really hard stuff of sending a real-time communication, voice, video call, it's already solved, it's already fixed. So what can you do with real-time communications that you couldn't do before? And there's so much stuff that you can do, and a lot of our talks today are gonna to be about some of those things. But uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the other exciting aspect is uh, what are the new boundaries of real-time communications, and, and what can we do now? And uh, I'll just finish off on a, on a couple points of where is WebRTC going, what are some of the harder things that, that people are doing that aren't potentially completely solved yet, right? And I guess I, I classify these things into three different categories. Um, the first category I call like super media, 
So doing a one-to-one, -one, sometimes in the industry we call it a talking head scenario, it's, it's relatively simple to do. Trying to do that now with you know, 3D, uh, augmented reality type scenarios, with you know, stereoscopic cameras, some of those experiences and challenges are a lot harder, right? You're dealing with a lot more media and a lot more streams and a lot more coordination. Right? We'll touch on some of the things like the VP9 codec um, and some of the aspects of what Chris will talk about in real-time streaming, which help with some of that. Another really exciting aspect I, I've seen come up a lot recently is instead of just you know, limiting real-time communications to a phone or to an app, you can basically put real-time communications inside anything. So it's really a question of what do you want to put it in and how, how, how much can you, you know, how far can you go with this technology. So there's a, there seems to be a, a growing intersection of WebRTC and the internet of things out there. And the last topic is, well, if you're going to have a lot more media, a lot more complexity, a lot more analysis, and you know, potentially billions of endpoints supporting WebRTC, how do you coordinate and manage all that, right? So there's, there, there's a number of vendors out there that are working on middleware solutions to figure out how to, how to make all of this work.